This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and you know, we've done something like this about a year ago. Funny that. This time it's the Galaxy S5 versus the HTC One M8. Now, last year we did the Galaxy S4 versus the HTC One, at that time just called One, now M7. So this year, some of the same things are going to apply, but there's going to be some new things too. Now, I know there's fanboys out there. I've seen you in the comments. I know you're calling each other's Muppets, Puppets, and Tools, so just chill a little bit, watch the video, and realize that you got to respect both of these phones. Alrighty, so this is the Muppet and this is the Puppet. No, but seriously, these are both tools in the good sense. These are very capable high-end smartphones, what we call flagship smartphone. That means the best that the manufacturer has to offer. Obviously, both of these are about the same size, 5-inch display on our HTC One, 5.1-inch on the Galaxy S5. You're not going to notice 0.1 inches, are you? No, really, I don't think you will. In size, they are slightly different because HTC has those speakers top and bottom. It's going to make it a little bit taller. Now, a little bit can be noticeable when you stick it in your pocket. If it pokes out a bit, you know what size pants you wear and how well you're handling your phone in those pants, shall we say. So I leave that up to you, but it's just something to keep in mind. The good part is the boom sound speakers, these stereo speakers, top and bottom, front facing. Isn't that a brilliant idea? Once again, HTC has some really good audio here, and it sounds as good as some Ultrabooks. Samsung, on the other hand, has a, a decent, adequate, it sounds like a cell phone speaker right here on the back. The back leads to another topic, and this is where it's going to sound a lot like our Galaxy S4 versus original HTC One comparison. This is genuine plastic. Samsung does genuine plastic. They do it really well, in fact, and I'm not being sarcastic when I say that. At this point, they've got it down. It's not the shiny, icky stuff that it used to be that picked up fingerprints and all that. It's, it's faux leather. I don't think it's really going to fool anybody, but it does feel kind of organic and grippy and very nice in the hand. It, it's a very comfortable phone to hold. Samsung is good at making things incredibly slim and very comfortable. Utilitarian, I would, I would call it, in fact. It's also available in white. And we've seen the wild electric blue and the kind of band-aid colored gold backs, but don't know if and when those will be available. The HTC, on the other hand, goes for that kind of iPhone aesthetic. It is just gorgeous, particularly the new gunmetal finish right here. It looks like brushed steel or brushed aluminum. Some people say it looks like a designer refrigerator. Uh, it's very nice looking. Really, it is. And I like the brushed look. This is aluminum. Single piece here. They've reduced the amount of copper polycarbonate, so it's just little bits on it, 90% metal, stunning, gorgeous, unique looking, it doesn't look like an iPhone or anything else, so when it comes to something that gives you that kind of ooh, ah, or kind of Rolex high, this would be a phone that does that, just like the iPhone also just gives you that really high quality feel, and these are personal devices, and it's understandable if you want to have a nice quality piece of hardware, so there's that. Obviously, on aesthetics and on materials, the HTC One M8 is going to win, just like the original HTC One beat out the Samsung Galaxy S4 for, well, nice materials. However, keep in mind also, metal is cold in the winter. If you live in Wisconsin or Michigan, uh, Vermont, you know where you live, Alaska, goodness knows, this is not going to be the most comfortable thing to pick up and hold in the winter time. It's also a bit slipperier. It's pretty comfortable. They've got nice curves on it with a little enough straight edge on here that you can hold on to it. Bezels are narrow enough that I find my fingers do wrap around and occasionally I do things I didn't mean to and they've made the volume button a little bit more easy to press and thus press accidentally. Samsung, I used to have a lot of problems with some of the Galaxy phones accidentally doing things I didn't want to do all the time. The fact that they actually made the bezel a little bigger has helped with that, so no finger wrap around issue not actuating the buttons as easily here. They've really just designed to feel very good in the hand. This is never going to be unpleasant in cold temperatures. So that's something to keep in mind. Likewise, if you like to game on your phone and you're doing real racing three for an hour, you're going to feel the heat on the back of a metal phone more than you will here. More importantly, though, than the aesthetics, perhaps, for those of you who believe that function is more important than form, we still have the great Samsung removable battery feature here. So take that back off. There's our 2800 milliamp battery in here and our micro SD card slot on top of the micro SIM card slot. So for those of you who like to swap in spares, that's great. Also, that leads into the waterproof nature. Right here we have a rubber gasket. This is a water resistant phone. Actually not waterproof. Water, waterproof is even more strict standard. 30 minutes up to 3 feet in water. It's supposed to work. 
There it is. So it's not that all of us take a bath with our phone intentionally, but accidentally sometimes we do. You get caught out in a rainstorm here in Texas. It can rain pretty darn hard. You don't have to worry about the phone. Those are nice things. Impressive that they managed to slim it down. This is even smaller than the Galaxy S4 Active, for example. Now our HTC One M8 is a solid sealed phone. So our battery is sealed inside here. The SIM card slot is on this side over here. The micro SD card slot is on this side and you need a pokey tool or a paper clip to open and close it. So either way it's equally annoying. You either have to rip the back off the Samsung or you have to find the paper clip to poke it out of here. But that's a good thing and that's changed from last year. They both now have micro SD card expandable storage. Yay! And in fact HTC pulls ahead. At least for our US version here we have 32 gigs of internal storage. Nice. So for $199, you're starting out with 32 gigs. With our Samsung, you only get 16 gigs of internal storage. Go, go HTC, go, at least here in the U.S. Now, in terms of weight, the HTC is going to be a little bit heavier because, well, it has that nice metal body. So it, it is noticeably heavier. If you like to wear those loose baggy pants, you might find them a little bit closer to your kneecaps than usual. It's not egregiously heavy, though, so not much worry there. In terms of thickness, they're pretty darn close. So how about displays? 1920 by 1080 full HD on both of these Samsung using their Super AMOLED displays that tends to favor more vibrant colors, deeper blacks, at the expense of sometimes not the whitest whites, though they have actually improved that and increased the brightness on their display. So pretty nice display, a little better than life. There, there are colored settings you can play with, so you can actually tone that down a little bit if you're more of a color purist and you don't want too much of a cartoony color experience. HTC uses an IPS style, shall we say. They, they don't say that's true IPS display here, LCD based. Always they make very lovely displays, very natural, very balanced. Now in terms of viewing angles, I, you can see the difference as we tilt back here. Actually the Samsung is maintaining better viewing angles, which is a surprise because previously HTC actually was the winner on that. So if we go sideways, we'll get a little glare there, but the same thing is true there. So we're going to have a bit wider viewing angles. Now, that's also affected a little bit by perception because of the different desktops that are on here, but it's, it's a big enough difference that regardless of the desktop, you're just going to always notice it. Another thing to note is you do lose a little bit of screen real estate on the HTC One M8 because it has on-screen buttons on the bottom there. Now Google wants manufacturers to do that. doesn't mean they'll necessarily listen, but they like Android to be done that way. And Samsung's still going with the mechanical home button, the clicky movie button, and two capacitive side buttons. So you're not giving up that little teeny bit of screen real estate. Honestly, it's not that much screen real estate. I don't think it's the end of the world. Some people are bothered by it. In fact, the buttons auto-hide in a lot of applications so you won't see them. Uh, the challenging part is trying to find them after they have been hidden. Now for camera, you, you thought you knew what was going to happen here, right? Where I was going to say the HTC One M8 not as good. Well, we're talking about front cameras right now. And you can see I'm recording both here. 5 megapixel front camera on the HTC One M8. Better colors, more natural looking. I don't look quite as pale. Uh, 2 megapixel camera on the Samsung. Actually, as that goes, that's not terribly bad either. It's pretty sharp. It looks better than last generation Galaxy S4, but big time definite win on the front camera for the HTC One M8. Not just based on resolution, better colors, better contrast, the whole thing. Both of them can do full HD recording and obviously you can do video chat and all that sort of thing too, but nice on the HTC One M8. Now let's talk rear cameras. We have the same ultra pixel, which is 4 megapixel equivalent camera on the back side. Right here we have the main lens and we have a secondary lens for depth information to do pseudo kind of depth of field kind of things, blur the background, do sort of semi 3D perspective warp sort of stuff. Honestly, I think that's more of a gimmick than anything else. Anyway, ultra pixels are nice because they have, it means bigger pixel sites. They let more light in, so low light photography can be good. However, it's really the same camera as on the HTC One, the last generation pretty much. And a year ago, it was pretty good when it was combating 8 megapixel cameras, but now that we're getting into even higher resolution, more sophisticated camera phones, it's kind of showing its age. And it still has the same problems with blown out highlight exposure. Now, images taken in the dark do capture a lot of detail. They capture a lot of noise too, but you will resolve more detail than on the Samsung, which tends to show more black spots. But for anything other than nighttime shots, I would prefer the Samsung. 16 megapixel camera on that can shoot up to 4K video. Now, 
4K isn't everything in the world, it's still a phone and all that, but it is pretty sharp relative to full HD video. And how about the interface too? So here, this is the HDC1, very minimalist thing. So some things are pretty obvious. you got your EVs, your auto white balance and stuff like that. So what do you want to do if you want to switch front and back camera? We're all used to the little arrow switchy picture there and, and different buttons for camera versus video. Well, in this case, you actually have to tap on that thing. They do a lot of those little subtle hiding things. And I never thought I'd say this, but sort of prove, I really appreciate Samsung. It's kind of everything is right in your face and it's intuitive. They may have a million more settings than anybody's ever going to want, but the the main settings are easy to find. Anyway, that's really a matter of personal preference and you know what kind of UI you prefer best. And we're going to roll in some sample video, both shot at full HD, same time within well, one minute of each other shooting the same scene. So you can see the difference and you'll notice that the HTC one blows out the highlights quite a bit more. So how about the Samsung Galaxy S5 camera interface? Here's what you've got. You can choose from modes, which is like beauty shot mode, shot and move panorama, that sort of thing right there. It's pretty obvious when you tap on mode. Camera versus video. Flash control right there. Switching front and rear cameras. This is HDR on and off. That might not be so wildly intuitive, but all in all, it's pretty easy. You don't have to guess too much about what you're doing. And here, you know Samsung, there's a million more settings. Now, you enthusiastic photographer types will enjoy having all those sorts of settings right there. So, lots to do right here on this interface. This is the HTC One M8. This is the Samsung Galaxy S5. Both full HD cameras. Notice the better water exposure and no blown out highlights. Now, speaking of lots to do in the UI, well, that's Samsung in touch with, so you probably know who you are by now if you've been using an Android phone for a while. You either like that kind of pure, clean approach of maybe even a Google Play or a Nexus device, and certainly HTC Sense 6 on the HTC One M8 is also a very clean experience. And on the other hand, you have Samsung's TouchWiz and also LG's LG UI, which is kind of similarly wildly busy. So the icons are a little bit more cartoony here. I like to say Hello Kitty. Speed is just fine. TouchWiz is not bogging things down. Their new settings is kind of weird. Now, this stuff is just fine, but when you get into the full settings, there's their new settings thing, like 60 items to scroll through there. Not my favorite kind of thing. You still get redundant image viewers, video players. Samsung likes to do that because they have their own applications that they roll in as well, which is probably a little confusing to more novice users because they go tap on a photo and you get a choice. Do you want to open it with this thing or that thing? You know, that sort of thing. So, TouchWiz is as ever busy. They have cleaned it up. They have made it a little bit less overbearing. It really doesn't weigh on the phone, but that it is what it is. Now, for those of you who really like the phone, but you don't like that experience, of course, you can put on something like Nova Launcher or one of the other third-party launchers that does hide this. But you will lose some of the nice features, too, like the multitasking UI, the, the drag, draggable, transparent video player, that sort of stuff. So there's some good Samsung stuff going on. It's just too bad you have to throw away it all if you use a third-party launcher, potentially. Another important thing I think is, see right there it says, say, okay Google, look at that, it's doing search just like on a Moto X, which is pretty cool. So they've got that new feature, okay, we'll stop it before it gets confused. So they've got that new feature from Google now incorporated in here. I like that a lot. Don't have to press any buttons. HTC, on the other hand, super clean look here on the UI. Nice. Looks a lot like a Google Play edition. Again, just your basic black background. You've got your icons unchanged, unmolested. So, pretty clean experience. And the way they handle settings is, well, you got to tap over here. And then you have quick settings over here. And then you can get to all settings if we want to go to all settings. It's not so different from the standard Google approach. They just use different color background on it. But straightforward, easy to use, no mystery mile of circular icons right there so it's nice and of course you get HTC blink feed that's your leftmost screen right here which is news social networking highlights this is a bit more customizable than flipboard on the Samsung Galaxy S5 which is a similar idea and I'll show you that now too 
they call it my magazine. It's really Flipboard on steroids. So news sources here too, but you can't customize them quite as much as on Blink Feed, like I said. And with both of these phones, if you don't like this, you can actually turn this off and just have standard home screens. And your home screen is, by default, the home screen. So how about horsepower and performance? You're looking at the same thing, folks. Nothing to see here. Go home. Don't even bother with it. Both Snapdragon 801. That's a quad-core CPU proct clocked at, depending on on the manufactured 2.3 to 2.5 gigahertz. Anyway, close enough to call a tie there. Benchmarks also very similar. Now HTC is the one gaming benchmarks and inflating results a little bit there. And Samsung says that they've stopped, but the numbers are still quite similar on all benchmarks. Both of these have 2 gigs of DDR3 RAM. Uh, the one place, as I mentioned, where HTC pulls ahead is by putting 32 gigs of internal storage versus 16 on the Samsung. That's for our U.S. edition. I know some of you folks in Europe are getting 16 gigs on both of these. Equally capable of playing 3D games, anything demanding that you want to do with the phones. They got the horsepower. They both feel fast and fluid. Now, Samsung does fight back a little bit with the fact that they hack Android to allow app installation, or you can move it, apps, rather, to SD cards. And that works for, not with system apps, but with other apps like games and stuff like that. Generally speaking, it works pretty reliably. So you can ameliorate the problem with having only 16 gigs of storage and 11 gigs available by doing that. Battery life, it's another tie right here. Both of these have high-capacity batteries. Uh, Samsung has a removable battery. Of course, you can get those external battery packs. We've reviewed lots of those on Mobile Tech Review, so you're not totally out of juice with something like the HTC One M8 or any other phone with a battery that's sealed inside. But beyond that, you're looking at high-capacity batteries, the new very power frugal Snapdragon 801 CPU, and they're both running at least a day on a charge with moderate use, not a, maybe even a day and a half, to be honest. And that equals about eight hours of actual screen on time. That's pretty impressive stuff. So both of these are real Energizer bunnies. Both of these have extreme power saving modes. They go about the problem in a different way. So if you're on your last leg, you only got 10% juice left, and you want to make sure the phone doesn't die on you completely, you can rely on that. Now, for our U.S. version, that wasn't there at shipping time, and HEC says they'll make it available later as an update so you can turn on the extreme power savings for our U.S. version of the phone. Both of the phones support the latest version of Qualcomm's quick charging, so they will charge very quickly. Right now, I don't know if Samsung has managed to get their charger supporting the latest version of Quick Charge, but I do find it charges even more quickly. HTC says in the coming months, the fastest version of the Fast Charge charger will be available for their phone. Samsung has a USB 3.0 port on the bottom, micro style, under a little door since this guy is water resistant. Right there, comes with the USB micro cable, 3.0 kind of cable that goes here. You can also use 2.0 cables if you want. Uh, right now, I don't think that's a giant selling feature. HTC still uses the usual micro USB 2.0 port on it. Now, the Samsung on the back has a heart rate monitor. You put your finger over the LED flash, wait and wait and wait, and it's going to tell you your heart rate, which I don't think is the greatest selling feature, really. I think people who are that into fitness either know how to take their pulse by putting their fingers on their pulse point or use something like a Fitbit, you know. But one thing that is very useful is the fingerprint scanner. So uh, it's a feature I've enjoyed on the iPhone, and here it is again. So it shows you how to swipe, just like that, and it works. I like that a lot. Honestly, I, I'm too much of a hurry and too lazy half the time to use a password on my phone to get alphanumeric or a puzzle-style password. That is easy enough to do. I like that feature a lot. The HTC One M8 does not have that feature. They did try that on the, on the One Max, but it was a different kind of fingerprint scanning technology, and it didn't work so well, sadly enough. So for those of you who are fond of that kind of feature, you're going to get it in the Samsung Galaxy S5. You won't get that in the HTC One M8. So in the end, both of these are really lovely phones. And, you know, I've said this before, and but it's really, it's true. I, either of these phones, I would be very happy to use. They both have lovely displays. They're very fast. They're responsive. They're well made in their respective different ways. Samsung in their plasty or practical ergonomic way. And this in the nice, fancy metal back. Not an easy choice. For those of you who actually listen to audio on your phone a lot, the HTC One M8 with the boom sound speakers surrounding the display... They're going to be a big win. I know you guys are dying to know which one I would personally pick. For me personally, this was a surprise. I know you're going to think I say HTC One M8. That's what all the tech journalists have been picking two years in a row now. And I haven't always been such a big fan of the Galaxy phones, but I'm finding that I actually enjoy the Galaxy S5. Personally, for me, 
a bit more because I do like that fingerprint scanner. A high resolution rear camera is really important to me. You may be different. That's why both of these are on the market. So that's the Samsung Galaxy S5 versus the HTC One M8. Again, available on all carriers for about the same price, $199 on contract and around $650 off contract. They're both really solid phones and it depends on what you like. Do you want the classy metal chassis or do you want all the features in the Samsung, for example? I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to watch our video reviews of both of these products, read our written reviews, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.